Hello everyone, welcome back. This is part one of booktube spin tag number seven, the last booktube spin tag, as of right now. Um, that first book is A Court of Thorns and Roses by Sarah J. Moss, the one that prompted me to read that one for last September's <laughs> Band Book Month, all prompted as a result of uh, a couple of stupid political personalities deciding to challenge Moss's book, A Court of Mist and Fury. I didn't know what to expect from this novel. I had seen them in Barnes & Noble, of course, over the years, just never really taking notice until the challenge. I was pleasantly surprised by how much I enjoy this novel. It's an interesting twist on a Beauty and the Beast story, but it's also a sort of combination with the True Bride story. I think most people are familiar with the Beauty and the Beast story, but might not recognize or realize that what a true bride story is about. As a general definition, um, the true bride was the title of one of the Brothers Grimm stories, um, and it's a combination of the persecuted heroine and the forsaken fiancé. <laughs> so literary, I guess, fairy tale tropes. Um, the Polar Bear King film is a great example of a combination of the Beauty and the Beast story with the True Bride story. It follows the Beauty and the Beast story up until the beauty, the princess, goes home to her sisters and is uh, convinced to do something. And it usually goes against the rules of the enchantment that the prince is under. So she breaks the rules, he is whisked away magically by the enchantress that did it to him, and she has to basically rescue him using her wiles and whatever gifts are given to her by a mysterious figure in the woods. And of course she ultimately rescues her prince, breaks the enchantment, and they get there happily ever after. A Court of Thorns and Roses does most of this very well. A little more adult, of course. Um, complete with the three trials for our hero to overcome at the end main character of A Court in Thorns and Roses is Feyre. She is the youngest of three girls living with their father in poverty within a little cabin in the woods near the wall that separates the fairy kingdoms from the mortal world. The fairy land itself is called Prithian and is divided up into different courts. The map in the book appears to be inspired by England, Wales, Scotland, and Ireland. The wall itself looks like to me, looking at a, a map of England, it looks like it runs from London to Gloucester. That's a, just sort of a, a rough estimation just by looking at a map. Uh, I don't know for certain, but considering that the island off to the east is called Highburn, which is the um, shape, the, the landmass is shaped like Ireland, and Hibernia is the old name for Ireland. I, feel safe in assuming that that's what it's based on. It's just sort of this alternate universe. At the beginning she's out hunting for food and she kills a wolf that is not really a wolf and is soon after visited by a fairy beast who says basically you killed one of my own, your life is now mine. You have to take his place and come with me and pay off that debt and of course to keep her family safe she agrees, and she is taken across the wall to the spring court. Once at his home, he is no longer a beast. He is a beautiful, very high lord with a mask attached to his face. It is stuck there by an enchantment. And this is Tamlin. She also meets Lucian, a exiled fairy prince from the autumn court, who acts as Tamlin's sort of emissary and sort of advisor. Tamlin makes his own decisions. He's also his best friend. He's gruff, he's rude, and one of the other fairy attendants named Alice gives him some advice on how to deal with him and basically saying he pushes you, you just push right back. And she does and they eventually build their own friendship throughout the, the story. And of course the whole court is enchanted, so everyone in the spring court has a mask stuck to their face. Feyre learns that these fairies were enchanted by the, by this story's main villain, a fairy 
lady named Amarantha. There is a bigger baddie out there who is, I think, briefly mentioned, but it does not make an appearance. While at the Spring Court, Farah learns that most of what she knew about fairies is wrong or mostly untrue, we'll say. There are some exceptions, but most of it is wrong. Like iron being toxic to fairies. It's not. That's probably the biggest one. And also kind of a departure from, I guess, traditional fairy lore. After several missteps, you know, some gentle wooing, some teasing, some near-death experiences, Feyre and Tamlin develop an attraction to one another. Then at a big fairy festival that Feyre was not invited to but sneaks out to go to, she bumps into another fairy high lord named Rhys, and he rescues her from some other drunken fairies who would have taken advantage of her. The character of Reese kind of subverts this Beauty and the Beast fairy tale in surprising ways that I was not expecting, especially given how he's described and his role in Amarantha's court. Um, afterwards, of course, Tamlin and Feyre bond some more, and then Feyre is finally threatened, and Tamlin sends her home. It's a big failure, of course, because she is drawn to him. She has to go back and find out what is happening. And she does go back and find out. She learns about the curse and that she was the key to breaking that curse. So she resolves to save Tamlin, to save the Spring Court, and by extension save the whole of Prithian from Amarantha's reign of terror. She walks right into the mountain where Amarantha lives and a challenge is issued and there are three trials arranged in proper fairy tale fashion. Feyre is beaten, thrown into a cell, and given nasty chores to do. Lucian heals her so she's able to perform the first task and she is badly injured herself. Lucian is punished off-screen for interfering and Reese enters the scene once again to present a bargain to Farah. Basically he'll heal her so she can perform the next tasks but she is ultimately bound to him that one week out of every month of the year she belongs to Reese for every year for as long as she lives. To seal the bargain an intricate tattoo is sort of magically placed on her arm sort of marking her as property? Sort of? Kind of? It all comes off as a little scummy at the time but as you go forward into it and they do have some interactions which in this book are a little odd once you get to the second book, they make a little more sense. Of course, this mark does come in handy because, in a way, Reese can hear her mind and can help her. It comes in very handy for the second task. One of the interesting things about Favor's character is she doesn't know how to read, and that is the second challenge. It involves reading. Well, she can read a little bit, but not very well. And thanks to the mark, Reese is able to help her by extension helping Lucian because he is sort of at the end of the trial. The third task finally rolls around and Feyre is not in the best place mentally or physically and this third task is physically and emotionally damaging and by the end of it she is broken and dead. Yes, I said dead. But of course, the enemy is defeated and the fairy lords present are grateful and they bring her back. But she's not human anymore, she is now fairy herself. And although her body is healed, it is clear that Feyre, Tamlin, and just everybody involved is not in great, not in a great way mentally. They're all wrecked by their experiences, including Reese, who their relationship at the end is fascinating. Her, the, her ease of talking to him is very different from the way she talks to Tamlin. Kudos to Sarah J Moss for having an ending for her story where the characters are not okay. And for starting book two with those same characters not okay after who knows how long of being tortured and abused. And also kind of doing what Anne Rice did with her beauty, with her um, Sleeping Beauty saga by presenting the heroine's 
true love or true mate after the traditional uh, happily ever after. It was also nice seeing um, in this version of a Beauty and the Beast story the sisters being presented in a more positive light as less uh, evil and just trying to survive in their own ways. And of course as of filming this I have read A Court of Mist and Fury so I know I know what's I would know what comes after. <laughs> Book two takes all the magic and action and romance and ups the ante on all of it all the while filling in the world with more characters and more details and a lot more character interaction, character development, and one heck of a teaser at the end. Some criticism for both. Because what, what, what good is a review without a little criticism? Uh, Favor early on in a, a court of thorns and roses is constantly repeating, trying to get out of her deal with Tamlin. It gets a little grating, but she's she's a young she's young so can let that slide the first line in the book is good it's the second line in the the novel that's a, a little odd i'd say it's not technically wrong it's just in my brain it seemed a little off i'd been monitoring the parameters of the thicket for an hour and my vantage point in the crook of a tree branch had turned useless. Monitoring the parameters. Why not perimeter? Again, it's not, not entirely wrong, just odd. <laughs> Thank you for joining me for part one of the final booktube spin tag. Probably. Hope you enjoy it. Uh, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe if you want to. Um, see you in the next one. Take care. Bye.